crazy conspiracy theorist classmate, Loki admitted to have contributed to her husband's passing. Hi everyone, this is my first post on Reddit ever. Hope this is the right subreddit to submit my story to. I have to premise that English is not my first language, so apologies for any mistakes in the text going forward. With that said, strap in. It's going to be a long post. So where to even begin? In my country, the government decided to push free personal classes to anyone who's either benefiting from welfare or just unemployment. I, a 30-year-old female, decided to enroll in one of those classes before moving to another state next year just to have something more on my CV and to have an excuse to touch grass since I'm unemployed. And I specifically picked social media marketing and management formation that started three months ago. Everything was great about it. And it seems to me all my classmates and professors were great people. I even started to make some friends. I must point out that no one in my class is underage, with the youngest being 21 and the oldest 56. After a couple of weeks of classes, they introduced us to the main curriculum of the whole course that will involve a months long projects among students. The project consists of inventing a brand from the ground up and marketing on social media as if it were real, about to launch on the market. I was super excited about this and couldn't wait to face this challenge. They picked the groups at random and the RNG gods chose me to be paired with a 56 year old woman, we'll call her M, that barely spoke to anyone up until this point. Thinking she was nothing but a nice lady, I tried to accommodate her for any preferences she'd have on the project, such as choosing what the topic would be about. She immediately starts telling me half of her life story, just out of nowhere, and focused particularly about a skin issue she had that she claimed doctors only made worse, and how she cured herself with herbs and essential oils. In hindsight, this was already the first red flag. Her rambling just left me scratching my head, and just to break the awkward silence, I said, we could pick that as a brand idea, a natural remedies, food supplements, and cosmetic brand. That's not some MLM. And she immediately agreed and smiled like a little girl, which back then made me kind of happy. After then, she picked the name, idea for logo, and motto without asking me for an opinion, saying it felt important to her, and that since I had no experience with this niche, I should learn from her. She insisted so much I had to comply, and that's when hell started for me. She would call and message me on WhatsApp constantly, insisting to see me work in real time on the designs, logos, mockups, etc., because she needed to supervise my actions. Her excuse being, I'm a little girl that hasn't known the world yet. She never liked any of my works and forced me to redo things over and over again. I'm on the spectrum and have a very hard time setting boundaries with people or dealing with the idea of displeasing someone. So I kept pushing myself to stay strong and keep going because I couldn't deal with how this woman would have reacted to anything she might have seen as insubordination. On top of the fact I didn't want to fail the course and from the beginning all of our professors insisted that the group project was vital to the final score. It is in one of those calls that she starts telling me some of the most unhinged shit I've ever heard in my life. After seeing me drink a sip of an energy drink, she screamed at me to toss that garbage away and then explains to me the reason why, in her opinion, energy drinks, sodas, and junk foods are infested with nano machines that infect the human body and rewrites their DNA. She then explains that that's because the great powers are not aliens like most think, but androids and AI hive minds ready to enslave humanity through biomechanical control. She also keeps going on about how AI exists since before Christ, came from an ancient civilization before the Great Reset, and that all great men in history were actually androids or giants. She also threw in the fact that she's sure dinosaurs are nothing but a fairy tale and could have never existed. The first incident, the biggest one, happened last month on one weekend evening where instead of slaving away from her, I went out with my mom to visit some friends and be back the next morning. I forgot my cell phone and realized too late, but since Em and I hadn't agreed to work that night, I thought nothing of it. Oh man, was I naive. My phone was blowing up with messages and phone calls, all from Em, except a couple of messages from another classmate of mine that told me she had called him obsessively, with demands of him showing up at my front door to make sure I was okay. Later that week, I get called into the school administration because Em apparently had called them too and told them that I had gone missing for three to four days. I tried in vain to keep it together and just burst into tears in front of the secretaries, telling them and showing them all this woman was putting me through, explaining my boundary setting issues, and they decided to immediately inform the professors. 
and find a solution that would have allowed me to not have any more contact with her. But before they could take any action, me and M were informed that one more student was going to join our group. We'll call him T. Nothing much to say about him. He's super nice and did help out that following week by not complying to M's demands and unreasonable standards. I insisted I take time off to do my own things too. For some reason, she never bitched about decisions made by T. In my last call with M and T, M goes on another unhinged rant. This one will be relevant later, and this is what makes this story fucked up on multiple levels. She claims she's being gang stalked and sabotaged by Big Pharma because she had invented a miracle ointment that could reconstruct any sort of biological tissue. She said she tested it on the hand of a friend of hers that had third degree burns, claiming she saw the nerves, tendons, muscles, and skin grow back, saving the hand. She then added that a prototype of said ointment that mostly consisted of garlic and aloe cured her husband from cancer a few years back. She also added like how after an incident over a decade ago, a doctor decided to sabotage her uterus during an emergency surgery to prevent her from having children. More of the big pharma sabotages involved several lawsuits she was involved in. She concludes that she's taking social media marketing classes with us because she wants to learn how to communicate with social media and the new generations. I'm personally afraid she's going to try to scam desperate people into buying her BS garlic and aloe miracle cure. The second incident happened the next day before class. A friend decided to sit next to me. Since that day, class wasn't going to involve the group projects. We put our stuff on the desk and since we were early, decided to go into the next room to get a coffee. M comes in and we hear a commotion in the classroom. When we peek inside, we see her tossing my friend's stuff to another desk. My friend asked what the hell she was doing, and M just coldly responded, the seat next to OP is mine. I nodded at my friend as if to say, it's okay, to try to defuse the situation before it escalated. Two days later, we get informed that I was swapped from M's group to another one. I will say that finally I'm working with the girl I made friends with, and we're having a lot of good fun. So. I thought it was over. No more of M's weird shit, right? The calls and messages from her never ended. Actually, she started obsessively calling the school and the professors, as well as to protest about the decision of removing me from her group. Her texts were filled with weird trivial questions about random topics or very personal questions, up to 50 to 60 texts per day. At this point, I stopped responding almost entirely to her and screenshot everything she was sending me. This leads us to the third and last incident, at least so far, that happened last week. I can't go too much into detail because it involves geopolitical beliefs and I don't want to war in the comments. The short, clean version of events is, M in class asked the professor a question that involved a very important global matter. He replied and then asked us about our opinion. Two people spoke before I did, giving examples of people or brands getting canceled for sharing political stances unwisely and how a problematic or controversial history or presence on social media might impact negatively one's chances of employment. It was only once I was back home, I realized that M had sent me several rage-filled texts claiming I was incredibly rude to have answered to her instead of letting the professor answer, and that she was expecting my apologies. I wrote a long text explaining myself, told her I would not apologize since I had done nothing wrong, and finally blocked her number. She thankfully hasn't been able to find me on social media yet, because I don't use my real name online. Since then, she's been missing all classes, which is nice because I really didn't want her to try and confront me in person. But it's what I've learned today from one of my classmates during break that left me horrified and pushed me to write this post. One of my classmates, we'll call her Y, told me that M and her had been exchanging texts from time to time, mostly because Y took pity on M, thinking like I did at first. She was just some weird old and lonely lady. In one batch of texts, she goes into detail about her husband that had passed away from cancer a few years back. Some of the texts read, We fought tooth and nail. We didn't bend over to men nor God, but they took him away from me anyway. I was so close to keeping him with me. At least I know he trusted and followed me until the end. These are verbatim, because after putting two and two together, me and Y figured she's either delusional and lying about everything, or she tried to cure her husband from cancer with her ointment instead of traditional medicine, effectively killing him. Also, we found out she's already selling her services inside of an SPA belonging to a relative of hers, using the name she picked for our project. She's also been using my work for her personal social media pages involving her services, which explains why she was so obsessive about supervising my work. She was basically getting free commissions out of me. Today was my last day of class, before the Xmas holidays, and after that, 
It's just going to be three more months until classes are over. I don't know where this story will lead me to further, but honestly, I hope she never shows up to that class again. I'm really hoping to not have to come back with more updates. Chased by a naked man in the forest. Hey y'all, this took place the summer of 2022, and I just never thought of writing down this story because I was so stunned that it happened to me. So every summer in my city, me and my friends like to make small campfires in chill and secluded areas because we don't want to drive an hour to an actual campsite and pay a campsite fee to do so. These also happen pretty spontaneously, so it's a nice last minute thing to do. There's this one spot near my house that's located by a river. That's really nice because no one usually goes there. The only things to be worried about are bears because living in the Pacific Northwest is challenging like that. And my house specifically is located right next to the mountains and forest. So one particular night at 11 p.m., I decide to go ahead of my friends and meet them at the spot and set up things early because I want us to be chilling once they get there. The spot I go to has a two minute paved walkway I have to go through. And then I have to take a small trail ramping down the right side of a bridge that crosses over the river. Along this paved walkway are two lamps located at halfway and another at the start of the bridge slash the ramp down to the campfire spot. I park my car at the beginning of the trail on the street and bring my campfire stuff like a flashlight, lighter, small firewood, a small shovel to dig out the pit, etc. I get to the spot and it's a small sandy beach kind of embankment on the side of the river with a small waiting area for toddlers and families during the hot summers. So I set up a chair and get to digging the pit with my only flashlight illuminating where I'm digging. I'm also just shoveling the sand right next to me, nowhere near the water. But all of a sudden I hear a loud splash, a splash so loud that it could only have come from something equally large like a two hand sized rock. I'm confused because I swear I'm not throwing my sand into the water, even though I'm only a few feet away. I shine my flashlight at the water and don't see anything. So I kind of just brush it off. I'm thinking I'm just hearing things. But as I keep shoveling a bit more, I hear another loud splash. At this point, I think something is falling from above because logically something must be falling into the water. I point my flashlight where the trees are above the river and I don't see anything big enough to make the splash. So as I keep digging, with my heart rate kind of going up at this point, I hear a rustling past the arch of where the bridge goes over the river. I quickly grab my light and shine it towards where I heard the rustling. I call out, hello? No response. In my head, if it was a bear, I should be getting out of there immediately, but there was no bear, or signs of anything for that matter. So I tell myself I'm just hearing things now, because I've seen horror movies before, and now my mind is playing tricks on me. But I hear the noise again, and it clearly sounds like leaves being rustled, so I shine my flashlight over to the area again, and as I focus my eyes towards the illuminated area, I see the naked back of a man hunched over. I was kind of frozen in anxiety and stress because honestly, of all things I was to see, I didn't think I'd see the naked back of a man. From the quick analysis my brain could muster up, he looked to be in his mid 40s, shaved and not bald, and a medium-ish build, like a mix between chubby and built. As I had my flashlight staying on his back, he started to stand up, and the first thing I noticed was that he wasn't wearing any pants either. My next reflex was to start packing up all my crap and getting the hell out of there because now I'm piecing in my head that he must have been throwing things into the water to scare me or shoo me away. So after using my reflexive deductive skills, I proceeded to speed walk out of there with all my stuff. I'm carrying all my things with me and briskly walk up the small ramp and I'm on the paved path now out of the forest. I can feel my heart beating in my chest and I am frequently looking back to make sure I'm not being followed. I'm in Crocs, mind you. So I'm hoping that if I have to book it out of there, I'd regret not being in sport mode from the get-go. I make it to the halfway point, and the sense of relief starts setting in, knowing I made it safely out of this very scary situation. But as I check behind me for the final time, I see something. Slowly creeping over the ramp is the naked man crawling on all fours, as if he was a primate walking. His head was positioned towards me, looking at me as he made his way into the middle of the paved walkway. He slowly gets up from his stance and starts standing on his feet, then positions his body to face me. After setting himself into his new position, the man starts running towards me. I freaking book it. I run as hard as I can down the path. My flashlight jumped out of my pocket and I lost it, but I didn't care. 
because a whole ass naked man was chasing me at 11 p.m. at night in a secluded forest. I looked back for a split second, and the man was still running towards me, still completely naked. He could have my flashlight for all I care. I wanted to make it out of this situation alive. I finally make it out of the forest, and I run to my car which is only 30 feet away from the end of the forest. I desperately get to my car, and like a classic horror movie, I fumble with trying to get my key fob to unlock my car. I even drop my keys and quickly think to myself, I'm actually dead, but I brush off the thought and pick them back up. I get my fob properly, unlock my doors, and throw my things into the back seat before getting into my car. This felt like an eternity, but in hindsight, most likely took six seconds altogether. As I try to guide my keys into the ignition, I am fixated at the end of the paved path that I was just at a few seconds ago, waiting to see if the naked man was coming still. I feel my key go into the ignition, and I switch my sights onto the road in front of me. Then I zoom out of the area as fast as possible. As I drive away, and I'm a good 30 seconds from the location of the horror that just took place, I get a call on my phone. It was my friends asking if I made it to the spot yet, and all I say to them is, Guys, do I have a crazy story to tell you? They pull up to my house because again, it was actually decently close to the campfire area, and I tell them the whole story the way I told it just now. They swear it was none of them trying to prank me or anything like that. I also knew none of them would try to full sprint at me with their dong out, but as we're standing in front of my house, there's a college student who looks like he's walking home that's going towards the direction of where I encountered a naked man. I just yelled out to him, Yo, be careful. There's a naked guy that was chasing me by the bridge that crosses over the river. He responds saying, Oh damn, really? I gotta go over that bridge to go home. All I tell him is, Good luck, man. The next day I reported it to the police by phone, but they sent over an officer so I could tell them in person and show them where in the area I saw these things. When we went there where I initially saw the man hunched over, they said they didn't see any trace of anyone being there previously, but an officer said they would make note of it anyways, in case it happens again. Some of my friends say it was a skinwalker, others say more realistically, it's either a homeless, mentally ill, or drunk slash high person. One theory I've heard my friends say is that it's a future version of me pulling a prank on the past version of me. Honestly, if time travel is real, I would totally screw with my younger self like that. So that's the only crazy let's not meet story I have, but damn, is it a story I will never forget. Boro, the Gaboon. This happened in Thailand in 2014. I had lost my job in Zurich and decided to use the opportunity to make a trip around the world, starting with Southeast Asia. I have always wanted to work with animals, so after backpacking Vietnam and parts of Thailand, I applied for a volunteer position at an ape sanctuary. They told me I could start whenever I wanted. The deal was that I had to make a deposit of around 2,000 baht, and they told me that if I stayed for at least three months, I would get 70% of my money back. The early days of working there were wonderful. The place was full of young, motivated people who thought they could save the world, one ape at a time. The majority of the animals were rescued gaboons. Our goal was to nurse them back to health and eventually release them back into the wild. Our responsibilities as volunteers were to feed them, clean their cages, and educate visiting tourists about the horrors of the illegal pet trade in Thailand. Before they came to us, most of the gaboons had been abused as tourist attractions. You know those pictures you see on Facebook from people being on vacation somewhere in Asia, where they hold cute animals into the camera? This is how poachers make their money. They will put a gaboon, lizard, or slow loris on your shoulder, snap a picture, and charge you for it afterwards. I can tell you that every single one of those animals has been through hell, and was, or will be killed soon after the photo was taken. The thing is, Poachers can only use the babies as tourist attractions, because as soon as they reach puberty, they become territorial and aggressive, and are then no longer of use to them. On average, to get a single baby, a poacher has to kill 15 other gaboons. This is because they are still attached to their mother at that age. The poachers will shoot her first, then they will shoot the father, because he will be trying to protect them. In most cases, the baby won't survive the fall from the trees, so the poachers have to kill a few more families until one baby lives. Then the real pain starts. They have their fangs ripped out without anesthetics, so they can't bite. They will be drugged so they stay awake during the night. When the tourists roam the streets, they will be chained so that they can't escape. They will be kept in tiny cages, 
fed the wrong food, and some will be taught to drink alcohol or even smoke. And as soon as they are no longer of use, they will be left to die. The poachers will then go and find the next baby. As you can imagine, most of the gaboons in that sanctuary were pretty traumatized. But still, working with them was fascinating. They all had their own personalities, including little quirks, preferences, and biases. Most of them were shy. Some only tolerated men when near them. Some disliked girls with blonde hair, etc. One female took a particular liking to me. Every time I walked by her cage, she would start me furiously. Her boyfriend who was kept in the same cage didn't seem to care at all though. I spent my days cutting fruit, mixing cement, hosing poo down the drain, and getting bitten by mosquitoes. Even though it was hard labor without any real pay, it was probably one of the best times of my whole trip. We all felt like we were doing something selfless, something noble. It was truly a fulfilling experience. Then, one day, I was scheduled to work in the quarantine area. This is the place that tourists never get to see. It is the place where they kept the really bad cases, the gaboons that have been damaged beyond hope. They told me some of the things that have been done to them, unspeakable horrors. All of them were either too sick, too weak, or too aggressive to ever be released back into the wild again. To be blunt, most of them were batshit crazy. First, there was Nini. She was hyperactive and showed self-mutilating behavior. You always had to feed her first. If she saw you give food to a different cage before hers, she would flip her shit rip out her water container, throw herself down to the floor, and start biting her own arm. She was also kind of mean. The other volunteers had warned me that she would try to startle me. She would hide in a dark corner of her cage, or acting as if she was busy or sleeping. But as soon as you turned your back to her, she would jump at the bars right behind you, with this ear-piercing scream, and rattle the fence. I have dropped more food than one basket in this manner. After a few times of that happening, I got sick of her shit. I filled my mouth with water and walked closely by her cage, facing away, just far enough so that she could not reach me if she stuck her arm through the wire. As soon as I heard her move, I instantly turned around and spit the water at her. It did not hit her, but she never tried to scare me again after that. Then there was one who literally looked and behaved like a zombie. His name was Fanta. He had been blinded by an infection in both eyes. They were white and foggy. Big chunks of his fur had fallen out, giving him a very decrepit appearance. He never swung, only moved by slowly walking along the branches in his cage. You had to rattle his food basket during feeding time so he would know when to come and eat. Another one was called Pam. She was special. They never told me what had happened to her, but she was missing one foot, one hand, and all but two fingers on her other hand. You had to cut up her food into really small pieces because she had a hard time eating. She was really old for a gaboon and very calm. Yet there was something out of the ordinary in her eyes. Something intelligent. She was the only gaboon we were allowed to touch. We had to, because we needed to apply cream and powder to her stump. She hated the powder though, and would only allow it if she got a little massage first. Like all the gaboons in this area, she was alone in her cage. I guess she was missing being groomed by a partner. A Thai worker told me a story about how some years ago, a volunteer who was going to clean her water container found it empty. That was unusual for Pam, because with only two fingers, she wasn't really able to drink that fast. He turned the container upside down, just to be sure, when a dark green scorpion fell out and crawled away. There were a few more apes in the quarantine area, whose names I have already forgotten, but there is one name that I will never forget. Boro. Boro was huge for a gaboon, and strong. If he managed to get a hold of your shirt, he could pull you to the cage and rip it right off your body with one pull. Same thing was true for tufts of hair. While most gaboons got really excited during feeding time, Boro was different. The first time I approached his cage, he didn't even come down to see what kind of food he would be getting. I could already hear him chew on something up in his cage. Black feathers were floating down from his branch. He had somehow managed to catch a bird. And Boro was one of the few gaboons who still had his fangs. There was also something wrong with his lungs. He was the only one you could actually hear breathing. And when he sang, which he did not do often. It had this weird rattling tone to it. Oh, and he was also infected with hepatitis. I can't remember which. And since he liked to throw poo around, his hands were sometimes covered in feces. So you'd better make sure not to let him scratch you. They had tried to find a girlfriend for him a few times, but it never worked out. It seemed like he just hated other gaboons. And for some reason, he really, really hated me. 
They had told me that Boro was not fond of new volunteers, but with me, it was a different level. For example, we used the water hose to clean the cages from feces. The water pressure was quite high, because after some time in the sun, the poo would be dry and really stick to the bars of the cage. Gaboons don't like to get wet. That's why most of them hid in one of the top corners while we did the cleaning. During those few minutes, I felt like I was in charge. I did not have to constantly cover my back. One mistake did not mean a new scratch or a urine stain. But to Boro, the hose meant nothing. Whenever I came close to his cage, he instantly tried to rip it from my hand. He didn't even care if he got soaked. He just cared about catching me or taking something away from me. Whenever I worked in quarantine, I could feel his stare. Whatever I did, he was watching me. Every single time I came close, he tried to grab me. He would hide in the shadows of his little house or behind some branches, then jump at the fence and reach through it. His claws were always exactly at face level, sometimes just a few inches away, grasping desperately. The Thai keepers told me that they had never seen behavior like that. One day, a huge spider web had appeared overnight between a tree and a cage next to his, blocking my usual path. I'm not a fan of spiders, and I was behind on schedule, so instead of removing it, I tried going around it. This meant I had to get a little bit closer to Boro's cage than usual. I thought it was still far enough. It wasn't. I tried to squeeze past the tree with my back to his cage, and he caught the collar of my shirt. I was lucky that I was already holding onto the tree, otherwise he could have pulled me to the cage. I heard him hiss behind me as I managed to pull away, my shirt tearing, and me falling face first into the web. I took a little walk afterwards to calm myself down. When I returned, he was quietly sitting in the shadow of his house again, breathing this slow, rattling breath. That was the last time I ever saw him. The things I'm about to tell you next, I did not see with my own eyes, but the keepers told us at lunch a few days later. That morning, when the keepers and some volunteers arrived at the quarantine, they felt like there was something wrong. Gaboons usually sing, especially in the early hours of the day. You can hear them from miles away if they give it their all. But this morning, it was quiet. The first thing they noticed when they entered the area was a huge red puddle on their Fanta's cage. What was left of him was hanging in the feeding area. They found parts of him in his food basket, outside of his cage, and on the ground. The second thing they noticed was that Burrow's cage was empty. What had happened was that that part where his house was screwed to the back of the cage had rested and combining his weight with his strength, he managed to rip it out and squeeze himself through the hole it left. Then he must have lured Fanta to the edge of the cage by rattling his food basket. None of the other Gaboons were hurt, fortunately. It was partially my fault that he had escaped. The volunteers were supposed to check the integrity of the cages at least once a week. The tool we used was a long stick with a metal hook on top. It should have been able to pull at the rusty parts of the grid to see if they still hold. But that type of work was a pain in the ass. The tool was heavy. The Gaboons would always go crazy and grab it. You had to go to the places in the area that were hard to reach, etc. So almost nobody cared to do it properly. The team they had to catch the Gaboons was literally one guy with a blow tube. He was actually a great guy. He taught us how to cook rice and bamboo, and he could climb a tree in seconds. But he was also an alcoholic. Almost every night he would down a bottle of Sang Som, and then try to find a new way into the woman's bungalow. Nobody really had any hopes of catching Boro again, unless he would return to his cage by himself, which some Gaboons before him actually did. From the moment they told me that Boro had escaped, working in the sanctuary became quite stressful for me. I always imagined him watching me from the trees outside. They went looking for him in the forest, but there was no trace. Not even once did we hear him sing in the distance. Still, every time a branch snapped somewhere behind the trees, I twitched. During the next week, we heard some of the tourists had been attacked by a wild gaboon. They went out in the forest and looked for the culprit, but nothing ever came out of it. The following night, I was awakened by a familiar sound. At first I thought it was my roommate snoring. Then I realized it came from the window, which had no glass, only a mosquito net, a slow rattling breath. It was Boro. It was pitch black, but I'm sure it was him. He was holding his breath every couple of seconds as if he wanted to be quiet so he could listen for something. I just laid there, trying not to make any sounds. I thought about what I was going to do if he decided to come inside. My plan was to use my blanket to shield my body. My roommate would surely help. After a few more moments, the rattling breathing stopped one more time. It never resumed. 
he was gone. The next day, I told our boss I was leaving, not only because of Boro, but some of the other people that I really liked were leaving too. I just felt like my time there was over. There were many more places in the world I wanted to see. I'm sure they were able to afford a few new cages with the money I left them, so I did not feel bad about my decision. I don't know if Boro ever returned to the sanctuary. When I think about it now, I just feel sorry for him. He was not evil, just a wild animal that had experienced more terrors than most of us can imagine. <laughs>